right, everyone with with a binder already. So those who were here last week. Most likely you will. And I'll make sure that all of our participants. I printed out a boatload. That's okay. So if you've been in the class before, we still got some seats up here. I'm going to put this in and see if that works better. Yeah, the opposite of that. I have, I have one of those nice, nice. Is this one for Joe has got the new one in it? It should, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, we are on session two. Um, if you all weren't able to make it last week um, and you didn't get to watch it online, I think it's online and I think it's accessible because a couple people watched it. If you have any questions about that, the link should be somewhere in the email, um, but I can help you find that if you need to. Last week was introduction, sort of broad overview, um, and we really, we started to get into even um, a theology of baptism last week. This, work, this week we're going to get a little bit more specific, and the end goal of this session is that we're going to get into actual, the baptismal liturgy. So I'm going to say this several times throughout this session. Um, you might think, well, I'm already baptized or I've been like, 
I've, I've been a Christian my whole life. I've been baptized forever. Why do I need to do baptism? Why do I need to talk about baptism? Um, well, hopefully I can demonstrate that you do <laughs> in the course of this, because we all do. Um, but uh, one, of the, one, of the things, one of the things that is a common phrase throughout the history of the church and something that I think is uh, in some ways synonymous with uh, remember that Christ died for you is remember your baptism. That phrase goes together because the baptism of Christ entering into the waters at the beginning of his ministry is clearly parallel to his entering into death and being raised for us at the end of his ministry. And so if you say, remember your baptism, it means remember whose you are, okay? Rem remember that Christ is your hope, okay? And this is how we are united to him. So uh, I don't care if you've been a Christian for 60 years or you're just inquiring about the faith in general and you don't even know if you wanna be baptized, this is, this is the start, it's the middle, and it's the end. So that's why we're starting here. And we'll get to a little bit more of that. As I said last week, we're going to get into a more, more robust discussion of the sacramental nature of baptism towards the end. Okay. So some of us come in with a lot of sort of Anglican questions, all of the history, sort of like uh, what seems like Catholic kind of stuff. A lot of those questions are going to be on the tail end. Uh, we're getting to the foundations, okay? This is foundation. Anyone and everyone who confesses Christ should have this perspective on baptism. That's, that's what I'm going to try to articulate here today, okay? So I want to begin with an image. And I, this is a pretty, pretty rough uh, drawing uh, illustration of this image, okay? But it, it's illustrating this idea. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I'm going to describe this, this picture as I go a little bit, um, but uh, here we go. So the late first century letter called the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, commonly called the Didache, uh, gives, if you want to sound pretentious and Anglican, just throw that word out there a little bit. Um, it gives instructions for baptism in water for those who desire to turn away from the way of death and follow Jesus in the way of life. Uh, we still follow this same basic model 2,000 years later. And so I want to talk about that. That's fundamentally a lot of what catechesis is. Uh, the Didache was the first catechism of the church. So in his preface to the great divorce, C.S. Lewis describes the accumulation of, light, of a lifetime of choices with the image of an ever forking or ever, ever branching out tree. There are endless forks with every decision in our life. Uh, in the road, you could use the road metaphor or a tree metaphor. With every yes and no, you either go left or right. Um, each of us off to a thousand different destinations. And there's two ways of doing this. And this is me sort of picking up on uh, the great divorce, um, but also sort of melding it together with a lot of other things in my head. So humanity was made to be grafted into a tree. Each branch producing beautiful fruit because they are united to the root, who is Christ. Every person who is united to Christ grows and expands into a beautiful, diverse unity, kind of like a tree. Um, we don't all become the same. We're all united to the same thing, but we, and we become increasingly differentiated, but we're not separate. We're united to a reality. Um, it's a diverse unity. So each branch is different. Each fruit is unique, um, but all are one in Christ. So the twist, and this is picking up on the great divorce, of the beautifully diverse unity in C.S. Lewis's uh, The Great Divorce, the image is that all these ghosts come out of a crack in the ground. And the crack in the ground is smaller than just like, a, like an ant hole. You know, it's just tiny. Um, but within this, and this is what this next paragraph um, and what the image on the side is trying to visualize, is it's, it's, sort of like a, it's sort of like a parody in my mind of what the diverse unity of the tree of life that is grafted into Christ is. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a series of cracks, an ever-branching out 
uh, space where in this ghost town in the great divorce, everyone is, everyone becomes more and more ghostly over time and they become more and more separate from everyone else. It's a, it's a provocative image. And it's, it, it kind of think, you kind of think like a tree. It branches out and each branch it becomes sort of this, uh, we get more separate in some ways. But in, in the great divorce, the ghosts that have been in hell and they end up, they realize that they're in hell. Um, they've been, they're, they're thousands of miles away from their nearest neighbor. They just become further and further consumed with themselves and more ghostly. Uh, so using this imagery, picking up on this imagery, the only way out of this is not to just go back to the last bad decision that I just made. This is something Lewis describes in The Great Divorce. It's not just like, oh, I did something bad yesterday. We gotta go all the way back to the first moment that we went wrong, okay? Where, where, we, where we, we, we initially entered into the crack, if you wanna follow this metaphor too far, and we've just been going away from Christ our whole life. Repentance is going all the way back to the start, right? It's, it's going all the way back to, and fundamentally, it's not just the start of all my choices, it's going to Christ. Christ is the root, he is the, he is the stump of Jesse, if you wanna use the imagery of Isaiah. Um, that all of life springs forth from. So we go all the way back to the start so that we can go a completely different direction. We can stop living in the parody, in the ghost town, and we can become real. So if, you, if you're like me and you like to take notes, you could like put a line at the base of that tree and write Jesus. And at the bottom, down by these cracks or else these sort of separated, spindly, nothing roots, you could write ghostly or alone or separated where everyone eventually kind of becomes the same, but they're totally distant from each other. Um, and, and it's parroting the reality, which is that we are all different, even, even different wild branches grafted into the tree that are producing fruit that looks different than the other fruit on this tree. Uh, we're united. So this is at the top. We're fruitful, we're beautiful, uh, in season or out of season, and we're real, we're tangible, okay? So one is a parody, one is the reality. So that's an image that I, wanna ha I want you to have in your head as we think about a lot of this. Um, going back to the start, going back to the root, going back to the source, fundamentally that's Jesus, and that's what we're all doing when we're repenting or dying in Christ. So. I'm trying to visualize and describe out loud something that's really helpful for me to picture what all of this thing is about. Um, repentance isn't just one event in the Christian life. It's a description of the whole thing. The whole journey is repentance. It's just stop doing what I think is right for myself and follow the one who, who gives me life. That's, that's what it is, okay? So Jesus came proclaiming, the kingdom of heaven is standing right in front of you. Turn around and follow me. That's what repentance is about. This is the choice before us. You either go your own way or you turn around and follow Jesus, okay? So that's, that's sort of an imaginative beginning. Baptism from the beginning to the end. So the ACNA catechism, to be a Christian, begins simply with Christ, whether or not you were raised in the church, the catechism begins, to be a Christian requires a deliberate personal commitment to Jesus Christ, much like a person makes in marriage. And this is the turn towards the baptismal liturgy, which we'll get into. To be a Christian is the way of not just life, of living, of flourishing right now, of being a Christ follower, of a deliberate active pursuit of Jesus Christ as his disciple. Um, some of you might Im immediately start going, well, so what? Then why about, what about infant baptism? We'll talk about that, okay? Um, what about that? Why do you guys do that? If you're gonna say that, why, you, why are you gonna say that too? Well, there's, there's good reason for it, okay? In the fourth century, St. Hilly of Potier said that everything that happened to Christ happens to us. So thus, we begin as Christ began. And you can look at the beginning of many of the Gospels. Christ was born of woman. Then, B, he went under the waters of baptism. We were born of woman. And, B, we're invited to be born again in baptism, to follow Christ, right? So uh, everything that happened to Christ happens to us. And the Holy Spirit 
descends upon us from the heights of heaven. We are adopted, now sons and daughters in God's house, uh, declared beloved by the Father from the start. This all happens at Christ's baptism, and it is declared of us. All of this because we are in Christ, and this is a big idea. We are made one in Christ. We are altogether the fullness of Christ. We are united to Christ in baptism. We are baptized into his death and raised to walk in newness of life. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Why? Because Christ is in heavenly places. We're in him. That's the imagination of the New Testament. Julie Canlis, a wonderful theologian, says it like this. In Christ, our whole selves are now reoriented and repersonalized by our communion with the Son of God. And that commu word communion is really important. We are declared beloved in Christ. Because we're in Christ, we are loved. This is our inheritance. Uh, because we have koinonia with God, and I say it like that because it's such an important word in the New Testament. Koinonia sometimes is translated fellowship. So in 1 John, it's often translated we have fellowship with one another and fellowship with God, that, that idea. But a lot of times it's participation um, or words related to that. It's, this word is about our being united to Christ. When we enter into the waters of baptism, we are, and so this is really important, it is about our choosing, okay? We are following after Christ, but so much more than that, in baptism, we are found in Christ. So it's not about Jesus goes and does something and then I follow after him. It's that as he enters into the water, we, as we're in him, do too. You see, you see the difference there? Um, it's what he does on our behalf, not primarily about us following after him. So both of those things matter, okay? Our, if, if the image is you see, you see Jesus go into the water and come out, and I'm after him, and I'm going to go into the water and come out following him, if that's the image in your head, that's a good image to have in your head. Here's the, here's the maybe more central image. You are in Christ mysteriously, you're a part of him. As he goes into the waters and comes out of the waters, we are in him, okay? So it, you see the difference? One involves us following him. There's a sort of active participation. The other is a participation that is not based upon our action at all. It's all him, okay? So that's the idea here. In baptism, uh, Peter Lightheart says, we are made members of the church, i.e., parts of Christ's body without any ifs, ands, or buts. We are sons and daughters of our heavenly father, objects of his loving care. Jesus is no longer present in his personal body, but the church is without any ifs, ands, or buts. His corporate body. Jesus is still available to the world through the church. Jesus and the church form one thing. Christ, what Augustine called the whole Christ, okay? So there's a lot going on there, and we're going to unpack that more in, in several lessons. Um, but uh, we are, we, to be united to Christ, in other words, is another thing to say is to be united to the church, because the church is Christ's body. He is the head we are the body, and we are all members of one body. So every Sunday, we celebrate our union, and I'm, this is talking about the Lord's Supper, and again, we'll talk about this more uh, later, but both of these central sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, um, point to our being united to Christ. This is very important. So our union with Christ at the Lord's table, by him and with him and in him, and that's a... That's a really loaded phrase. It comes straight out of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. You can see it in the prayer book on page 134. That's by him and with him and in him and the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. That is, that's the big deal, right? That, like it all comes together. That's our union. The reason, and I'll, I'll just, I'll tease it, right? The reason why I hold that up is because our participation in Christ is the central thing. It's about our fellowship being united together. The, the practical reality of the reason why they elevated that at that point in the service is because 
usually the priests were at the table like this, and they're doing this, so nobody could see it. It's like behind their chest, right? So that's what. So if we ever did ad orientum, which means facing east, um, and that would be like me coming to the table on behalf of the whole congregation, and the table would be right here, and you're all behind me, I think that would be weird for a lot of us. We'd be like, why is he not looking at us, right? Um, that's actually the more ancient practice, which is like, I am representing the church as I come to the table, right? And I lift up Christ, the body. And so you guys can see it. This is how we come to this table. This is how we have fellowship, okay? Um, so we begin and end with Christ. And this way is physical from the start all the way to the finish, physical water, physical bread and wine, physical resurrection, physical ascension. We begin with baptism because we begin with Christ, all right, so uh, quick moment for questions. Anybody have any questions before we move on? A lot of this, hopefully, we build on and we answer questions that might be coming in your mind. But I encourage you uh, to write maybe in the margins. I don't have any extra pens if anybody has extra pens. If you have questions, put them there. Uh, you don't have to necessarily ask them to me right here. Um, you can talk about it with your sponsors. Um, they might have ideas or thoughts or be like, oh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that question either. That, uh, that's good too. Um, I try to give some margin there on the side of the page uh, for the note takers. I love doing that. So our inheritance by grace through faith. So let's shift into inheritance language. So think of families. Think of parents, what parents pass along to their children, okay? Um, and this is kind of picking up on something I talked about a little bit more lack, last week. We, we begin like children. So before we begin talking about being a disciple or an active pursuit of Jesus, which begins by the, by the Spirit and Holy Baptism, we must pause and talk about what baptism isn't. Baptism isn't for people who can pass a test. And I'm saying a lot of the same of what I said last week, but I'm going to say it again especially because we're getting into a lot of deep theology and stuff that I want you to know, that I want you to have in your head. But this is not cramming for an exam, and if you don't pass the exam, you can't get baptized. Absolutely not, okay? Uh, I love this idea. When I was 10, Lewis wrote in a letter, um, not in a letter, this is in a talk to literary scholars, almost the exact opposite of that. When I was 10, I read fairy tales in secret and would have been ashamed if I had been found doing so. Now that I am 50, I read them openly. When I, become a, when I became a man, I put away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up. So Lewis is, is playing on the distinction that I would talk about last, like childlikeness. Being like a child is good. Don't be childish, but be, be whimsical, be alive, be a child, humble yourself. You don't have to be smart to begin fo be, to be a follower of Jesus. Mentally disabled persons, PhDs, small children, new adult comforts, infants. In fact, an infant born into the home of a believing parent embodies our great need more deeply. It pictures it in a more beautiful and in some ways just a more powerful way. An infant cannot do anything for themselves. They trust and receive with simple faith. Everything is an inheritance as an infant. So truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. That's, that's why baptism is so important. To be like a child with open hands and unquestioning trust in their father, this is the way that we all must enter. A person does not start with baptism and then advance to higher mysteries. In baptism, each believer already possesses, this is inheritance language, the faith that it, in its fullness, it's yours. It's given to you, it's deeded to you, it's your inheritance. The whole of life is encompassed in the mystery of baptism, dying with Christ and rising with him through the spirit to the glory of God. That is how the Christian life begins and to seek to move beyond that beginning is really to regress. This is so important. In discipleship, the one who makes the most progress is the one who remains at the beginning. Nothing before baptism makes us ready to receive grace. You can, you can look at the 39 articles of the Anglican religion. So these are sort of Reformation principles that our church articulated in the 1500s. Uh, nothing. So the first part is about uh, our good works, okay? Nothing good that we do 
makes, helps us merit to receive grace before baptism. And no good works after baptism are required for salvation. Our sin, so here's the negative side of that, our sin before baptism can't disqualify us from receiving God's grace, and neither is our sin unpardonable after baptism. So whether, whether we're talking about before or after, merit or demerit, no. That, that's, not, that's not what makes us able to participate in this mystery. Our righteousness is not in us, but in Christ, John Calvin says. Uh, we possess it only because we participate in Christ. In fact, with him, we possess all his riches. Think about that inheritance. This is ours. This is ours. Not because he did anything. Good or bad, you don't lose it. It's because of grace. Because you're his. With him, we possess all his riches. At least once every year at the Easter Vigil, every Christian remembers their baptismal inheritance when we recite our baptismal vows aloud together. And every time someone comes to the waters of baptism, they never confess their faith alone. We always confess it together as a whole church. They get to join in it. They get to join in with us. They join their voice with the great chorus of the saints around them. As one Anglican theologian says, it takes a church to baptize, okay? Um, uh, one, one more good idea that I think goes along with this, uh, and I picked up on this from uh, a good friend of mine, Dan Alger, who leads the church planting initiative of the Anglican Church in North America, um, and that's what this picture is. Um, Father Alexander Schmemann explains that no matter how adult or mature a Christian's confession is, they never really, they never fully understand the gospel, and certainly not at the beginning. Okay, so you don't have to have it all figured out. That's not what this class is about. We want to go deeper into that mystery. Um, ben Myers, in his book about baptism, or actually maybe the Apostles' Creed, uh, they all go, they all line up together. He says that uh, you inherit the kingdom. Right, it's all yours when you, whenever you come into Christ. But like a child who's in a castle and the fields all around the castle, you explore it more and more as you grow up. You you understand more about the inheritance that's already yours. Okay, so that's what we're doing in this class. We're exploring a vast kingdom. We're exploring every nook and cranny and every secret passageway and every sort of like, oh, that's not a main room. That's a side room. Like some people go into that room. You don't have to go into that room, but it's yours, right? There's a lot of things like that in the church. Um, I love this, the rings imagery. Um, so you can kind of see everyone is welcome. Everyone is welcome in the church. If we don't welcome anyone and everyone, regardless of baptism, we're not doing it right. Um, but there's then a, then a uh, sort of a entering into Christ, entering into with a whole heart, the fellowship of the church that is signified in baptism. So that welcome uh, turns into uh, we're being shaped at the table as we gather, right? You can't, you can't be, a, in other words, you can't be a Christian unless you get together with other people because you can't eat food and drink, you can't eat bread and drink wine unless you're actually physically to the, together. Uh, the gift of online stuff, that's great. Um, the gift of resources and things online in sort of a disembodied way. Like we don't want to cast the baby out with the bathwater, but we, we have to be together. You can't eat unless you're face to face, unless you're at the table together. So that's, that's the central shaping. Um, and then at confirmation, it's sort of a confirmation. We can talk about this more another time and we will talk about it more later. Um, confirmation is a bishop coming in and saying, I confirm everything that happened at your baptism and that you've been shaped in. Um, that you, you love this faith and you want to go deeper into it. Uh, and then you're sent out as a missionary, not ordained, but, you know, Bishop Steve often talks about confirmation as the ordination of the laity. Um, you're like, he lays hands on you in a similar way to he lays hands on me and he sends us out into the world. Here's the thing, though. This, this chain, the reason why it's uh, unbroken is not because I cut it off. It goes on on repeat. Okay, you hear this? You don't get rebaptized, but you remember your baptism. And then you come back to the table and you're sent out into the world and you remember your baptism. And you come back to the table and you're sent. Like, we, we, we need to always be going back to the start and this, the, we remember all of these in the sacraments over and over and over again, okay? Um, so let's turn to the liturgy. That's where we're gonna 
fix most of our attention. It's 9.39, we're doing okay on time. That's, I, I so rarely get to say that out loud. So. Um, so this part of the Liturgy of Baptism is on page 164. It, it, it's, it's, it's in the footnotes or in one of these quotes later. Um, but that's what we're going to kind of follow this. Uh, in some ways, it's a marriage service, okay? A marriage to Christ. So the Liturgy of Holy Baptism. Human beings are social creatures. We were made this way, and every time human beings gather together, they engage in communal rituals. Football teams process onto the field. Hands go over hearts. A song is sung. Maybe it's a Pledge of Allegiance or something like that. People lift their hands and voices as one when things go good. That's what people do. These are liturgies. Uh, even, even our grabbing our phone and picking it up is a liturgy, right? <laughs> even Apple wants to control what we do with our bodies, okay? So it's, it's kind of remarkable. Anyway, I, I digress. Followers of Jesus participate in communal rites, signs, and sacraments too. From the very beginning up to the present, the church has taught that God can... This is really important. God can save people without baptism or the Lord's Supper, but the Christian life normally revolves around rites or signs. Okay, so the exception proves the rule, in other words. The thief on the cross who died without baptism, today you will be with me in paradise. That's what Jesus declares because of his faith, okay? So it's not, a, it's not a magic thing. If you're baptized, I'm in, or whatever. Or if I'm not baptized, that God does not work outside of those normal means of grace. But normatively, baptism, salvation, hand in hand. They go together in the history of the church, and I think it's scripture, okay? So first, this is what we do in our liturgy. We turn away. We begin the Christian life by renouncing the devil, the world, and the flesh. Or our godparents and, and sponsoring parents speak on our behalf in the case of young children and infants. Uh, so here are the questions, and we're going to practice this. It, I would love to invite you to say these out loud in response to me. If you're uncomfortable with that, that's fine, okay? If you don't know if you believe these things, that's fine too. You can say it or not say it. That's fine, okay? So I'm going to ask the question and then be ready for the response on the next page. I'll say it with you because it's my confession as well. Do you renounce the devil and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? I renounce them. Do you renounce the empty promises and deadly deceits of this world that corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? I renounce them. Do you renounce the sinful desires of the flesh that draw you from the love of God? I renounce them. Okay, so at the start, we turn away from every other way. Think about the cracks again. The cracks that leave us, make us ghostly and send us out into nothingness by ourselves. Okay? There's, there's countless other ways. Okay? And these ways are not impersonal. This is something that we're saying. If you didn't notice, that's what we're saying. They are carefully curated personal attacks from the father of lies, the devil. Okay? At the first, he is out to get you. I encourage you. This is not an antiquated belief. Okay? This is real. This is true. This is impacting you even now, even if you don't believe it. This is exactly what we should expect. What happens immediately after Jesus comes out of the waters of baptism? I, I use Matthew's gospel here as an example, but um, Mark's gospel is perhaps the, the spiritual warfare gospel. <laughs> like it's, it's unclean spirits and demons over and over again, and that's the rhythm. <laughs> I love it. Um, but you could go to any of these gospels. Um, immediately after he comes up out of the waters, he goes by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by who? The devil, the devil, the temptation narrative. What happens after Jesus renounces the expertly crafted temptations of the devil that are expertly crafted for him? Uh, and you'll get your own expertly crafted temptations that are that are very, very tempting to you. Repent, turn around for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus invites his disciples to follow him and renounce the devil but not in our own strength. Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray. 
And we pray like this. So just a few chapters later, right at the center of the Sermon on the Mount is the Lord's Prayer. Jesus teaches us how to pray. And at the beginning of that prayer, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, we say evil. That's the older traditional way to translate that. I think it's clearly in Matthew's gospel in context, the evil one. Jesus just conquered him, the evil one. And now he says, this is how we pray every day. Deliver me from not evil as some sort of uh, impersonal thing out there that we need deliverance from, but from this one who attacks us, okay? We're not alone in the fight. The one who drove the devil away with a word, the one who sent demons into pigs to be destroyed, the one who daily made war against principalities and powers is with you. And I would add, you're in the church. You're with people who are fighting alongside you, okay? So, uh, and that's to be with Christ. There's the mystery, right? We are all together the body of Christ. And so he is with us even as we're with each other. Um, good Lord, deliver us. And that's pointing to the great litany, which I don't want to go into right now. So go read the great litany with your sponsor on page 91 through 97. Or, or better yet, read it alone in your prayer closet on your knees this week. Such a good prayer. Um, uh, but the evil one is not alone. The devil is very closely aligned with the world. And so in scripture, oftentimes it's ambiguous, especially in the story of the Old Testament. Uh, is it a demon or is it a wicked prince, a wicked ruler of the earth? They, they, the, the thrones of kings often overlap with, with the demonic powers, the fallen spiritual forces, the demons, okay? Um, gods, right? There's a lot of overlap in scripture. And so the world comes in too. Father Ben describes the world as any system of business, government, education, media, religion, or any other society that says, go your own way, do your own thing. These are the empty promises and deadly deceits of this world that we must renounce. This is what we're turning away from. These world systems always lead to oppression to the corruption and destruction of God's good creation, including people and human bodies, but also this earth. So creation care is very important uh, in the history of the church, caring for neighbor or na uh, nature. Uh, and in the end, they always lead to division and broken relationships. But this war for our souls isn't just out there. It's within us. Okay, so we're... We're turning to the third renunciation. So we did the devil, the world. There's so much we could say about all these guys. But the devil, the world, and the flesh, okay? Romans chapter 7. This is the apostle Paul, in effect, uh, renouncing his flesh. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So we're, when we're renouncing, we're like, God, good Lord, deliver us, even from ourselves. If the personal attacks of the devil and the unceasing corruptions of the world are not enough, then the war of sin deep down in our hearts is enough to drive us to despair. Our nature is fallen. Our first human nature is corrupt, even from our, from our, from our childhood, from our, from our youth, from our infancy. When we not only give in to temptation, we want to. So it's not that we just make bad choices. We like it. We give approval to it. That's what we do reflexively because we're fallen. We, we need a new nature, and this is... Uh, you think about, we talk about this in our culture about like, uh, you want that to become second nature, shooting free throws, because you practice it so much. You're training your body to do something as a second nature. That's an ancient Christian idea. Our first nature, because it's corrupted, it's not completely lost. It's not completely, I mean, there are people who are, who are virtuous and good people in this world who are not followers of Christ, right? So there's, the image of God is imprinted on every human person, but we're bent, we're twisted. We're all twisted in our own sort of special, unique ways, okay? Um, but we need a second nature. We need a gift of a new nature. And that's partly what the Spirit, um, and I think this is 
the foundational, the spirit who causes new birth. He gives us, uh, he pours himself out in us, gives us a new nature, makes us alive and new. Um, but it's also related to our habits. Again, think of free throws. Think of uh, choosing to uh, pray a psalm when, our, when we're ticked off at an enemy rather than go to war against them, right? Um, let God go to war against them in our prayers. Um, so uh, after his lament, though, I, I love this. You don't have to despair, even when you feel helpless, even when you feel like you are losing the battle against your flesh. Paul was in that place. Um, he doesn't despair. Why? Look at this. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Best question, guys. Ask that question when you're despairing. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus. All right? So... There's the Sunday school answer. He will, he has, and he will again um, deliver us from this body of death. But Christianity is not primarily about what we are against. Here's, <laughs> this is a big deal. Often Christians uh, live in this space all the time. I encourage you, I encourage you, um, don't be always a negative person. I, it's not about, we don't, we don't live in this, I'm against the world and I'm against the devil and I'm against all sin and flesh, you know, that can be very easy to get caught up in, right? We turn away, but the point is that we're turning to, okay? So repent, then turn to Christ alone. We cannot simply turn another direction on the ever ex expanding or branching tree of life choices going our own way. Neither can we just kick out a demon and turn to nothing, right? You kick out a demon and a hundred more come in its place. We need what Thomas Chalmers calls the expulsive power of a new affection, a new love that's stronger. We need to turn to the person of Jesus so he can drive out the demon, so he can expose the foolishness of the world, so he will forgive and heal us from our own sins, so he can take up residence in us, okay? Your grandma is right. He's knocking on the door. I want to ask him into the house of my heart. Okay? Don't spurn that. That is, if you have any image in your head, listen to your grandma who said, well, Jesus is knocking on your heart. Open up and let him in. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. We need someone to take up residence in us. Uh, not positively, right? Not, it's not a negative thing. It's a, it's a love. It's a new thing that that makes us so excited in this life. So after the renunciations, our liturgy continues with a prayer for Jesus to do just that, an exorcism. So if you're baptized in this church, um, you will be prayed over, and I will pray that the Lord would cast out any principality and power in you, around you, before you, whatever, okay? This is an exorcist prayer. Hear this. Almighty God, deliver you, and I'll anoint you with the oil of exorcism, okay? I'm pouring it on your head. You get really oily in this moment in the liturgy. Almighty God, deliver you from the powers of darkness and evil and lead you into the light and obedience of the kingdom of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, hear the turn there? We're going from the renunciations to the to the affirmations, okay? So get behind me, Satan, in, another, in other words. This is what Jesus says to Peter. Uh, now with the devil gone, we turn away, but we don't turn to a doctrine. We turn to a name. Ben Myers said that the earliest Christian confession consisted of just two words, Kyrios Iesu, Jesus is Lord. We turn to him. We turn to the person of our Lord Jesus Christ with three affirmations. All right, you guys ready to get married or practice? This is like a this is like a wedding rehearsal. It's not the real thing. Just say no. Um, but you can. You, I would love for you to say out loud the bold parts. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and confess Him as your Lord and Savior? Amen. I do. Do you joyfully receive the Christian faith as revealed in the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments? I do. Will you obediently keep God's holy will and commandments and walk in them all the days of your life? I will, the Lord, be my helper. Does that sound like a marriage ceremony? Yes. It should. It should. It really should. <laughs> 
Good answer. I love that. Turning to Jesus isn't primarily about beliefs. There's plenty of necessary teaching. That's what we're doing here and we'll be doing over the coming weeks. But beginning with holy baptism, it recenters us not primarily on our minds, but aims to capture our hearts, our whole selves, body, soul, spirit. This is what we say, love the Lord at the beginning of every service. We summarize the law. I summarize it over us usually. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, body, and strength, mind and strength, okay? Um, in love for Jesus. Like marriage, our vows, our confession really matters, but only insofar as they point to the intimate reality of our union, okay? So the vows aren't the most important thing. It's what they point to. It's what they point to. We begin by turning to our strong king who can crush the devil with one breath. And then he turns his face with complete gentleness towards the lowly sinner who simply says, I do. Oh, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. But Christians don't turn to an idea of Jesus. We turn to Jesus as he is revealed in Holy Scripture. Okay? So when we turn to the person of Jesus, we're also affirming that we're turning to the Bible, the Old and New Testaments. The first five of our 39 articles of religion are about God. Okay, so the first things that we confessed in the, in the 15th century as an Anglican church was along with the rest of the reformers uh, and really along with the rest of the church. So the reformers were not trying to leave the Catholic church. They were trying to reform the Catholic church and they were trying to say, hey, this is what the church has always said. We're about God first. Who is God? So the first five articles of our religion are about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then it turns in article six immediately to the scriptures because how do we encounter God? He's a speaking God and his, and his word uh, is, a, is a faithful account of his speech to people. Okay, so that's where we turn. So Article 6 of the sufficiency of the Holy Scriptures for salvation. Holy Scripture containeth all things necessary to salvation, so that whatsoever is not read therein, nor may be proved thereby, is not to be required of any man, that it should be believed as an article of the faith, or be thought requisite or necessary to salvation. In the name of the Holy Scriptures, we do understand those canonical books of the Old and New Testament of whose authority was never any doubt in the church. So Article 6 goes on to name the 66 canonical books of the Bible. Um, some of you might know those as sort of the Bible <laughs> or just pro our Protestant Bibles. Most Bibles that are published today have 66 books. Um, it also goes on to mention the other books, which are commonly called the Apocrypha or the Deuterocanonical books, uh, as profitable for example of life and instruction of manners, but not to establish any doctrine. So we can talk about that more. Um, essentially, uh, the early church in every place and everywhere all eventually, um, by really the early, early second century, or sorry, late second century, early third century, um, in every place, these 66 books of the Old and New Testament were beginning to be bound together. They were all coming together. There were some places that had some of these apocryphal books bound with them, and other places didn't, right? So we, Protestants in general, say that these are the 66 that the whole church agreed upon as being Holy Scripture. And the other ones... Were all were beneficial. They were like they were right there with them, right? Think of maybe your favorite theologian or favorite commentary or favorite history of the church or something like that. That's what a lot of the apocryphal books are, um, but they don't establish doctrine. They're just helpful. They're helpful. Okay. So in holy baptism, we say, "I do in love for God the Father and the Son by the Holy Spirit. God in Christ has made the way of salvation, and this good news is found in Holy Scripture." So that, that's the logic, okay? The logic is God, we're in him, and we find that map, okay? You can remember back from last week. Uh, so with joy, we receive Holy Scripture. We say, I do. Our final affirmation, more than simply I do, acknowledges again our great need for God to do what he does best. Save us, please. Save us, God. Will you obediently keep God's holy will and commandments and walk in them all the days of your life? So good, I will, 
right? You hear, you hear the like resolve in that? Say it with a whole heart. I will. I'm going to do it. I will. The Lord being my helper. Ground. Okay? Effort. Acknowledgement that we need God to help us. Right in the same sentence. I love that. This is where we are going. This is what we're going to be doing. Uh, deeper into the way of life, deeper into the Apostles' Creed. So if you remember back from last week from J.I. Packer, the simple roadmap of the terrain, the simple map of uh, driving on the road, uh, deeper into, um, so, which summarizes the heart of the gospel in Holy Scripture, which is, use Packer's imagery, the detailed relief map that shows all the crags and bogs and uh, goalies, and we would say hills and hollers, right? All the things that are off the map. Um, so uh, the creed sort of is sort of a summary of the Holy Scripture in that way. Um, deeper into the Ten Commandments, which summarize the double love of God and neighbor. So we want to we want to obey God. We want to say with a whole heart. If you come to baptism, and if you're remembering your baptism, you want to say, "I will." Keep the commandments. You got to know what the commandments are, right? So that's what we're doing. Uh, the Ten Commandments was summarize this love for God and love for neighbor. That's the, the two tables of the law. Um, we're going to go deeper into the life of prayer and in the Lord's Prayer. Deeper into the mystery of the gospel on display in Holy Baptism and Holy Eucharist. So that's sacramental theology. That's what we're doing, okay? Um, we're going to go deeper, deeper. Daily dependent upon God to save us. So even as we with our wills, make affirmations and resolve to follow Jesus, we recognize that God is going to have to do some major work, not just at the beginning, guys, every day, every day, all the way to the end. Obedience is the key to all doors. Feelings come or don't come and go as God pleases. We can't produce them at will and mustn't try. So just resolve, make a decision. That it's so important. Um, the way of life, the way of Jesus, is is the way of flourishing. Everything else is a is a pale myth. Um, it falls apart really quickly. Okay, um, we are children of the church, and this is turning towards the end. In the fourth century, Cyril of Jerusalem addressed both the young and the old as the children of the church. I love this explaining to them what happened to you on the evening of your baptism. So we can think about this is the kind of rehearsal that we might, we might tell to our children who were baptized before they really remember it um, as we light a candle with them. Certainly every year as you're coming to the Easter vigil, you'll, you would do this kind of thing, but um, do it over and over again. Right? Light that baptismal candle. And remember the baptism. Remember the story. This is what happened to you at your baptism. And this is so good for not just little children, or, but adults, people who come to faith later in life, who, who come with a whole heart and confess Jesus and are baptized by confession, right? All of us, we're doing the same thing, okay? I love this. Um, so this is Cyril of Jerusalem. First you entered the antechamber of the baptistry and turned westward, westwards. When you were told to stretch out your hands, you renounced Satan as though he were there in person. Now you should know that ancient history provides a type of this. When Pharaoh, the harshest and most cruel of all tyrants, oppressed the free and noble people of the Hebrews, God sent Moses to, to deliver them from this harsh slavery which had been imposed on them by the Egyptians. They anointed their doorposts with the blood of a lamb so that the destroyer might pass over the houses which bore the sign of this blood and miraculously set the Hebrew people free from their bondage. After their liberation, the enemy pursued them. And on seeing the sea open in front of them, they still continued to pursue them only to be engulfed in the Red Sea. Let us now pass from the old to the new, from the type of to the reality. Ooh. There Moses is sent by God to Egypt. Here Christ is sent by the Father into the world. There he was to lead an oppressed people from Egypt. Here he was to deliver those who are under the tyranny of sin. There the blood of the Lamb turned away the destroyer. Here the blood of the unblemished Lamb, Jesus Christ, puts 
the demons to flight. In the past, the tyrant pursued the Hebrew people right to the sea. In your case, the devil, the arch evil one, followed each one of you up to the edge of the streams of salvation. This first tyrant was engulfed in the sea. This one disappears in the waters of salvation. Oh, guys. Rehearse that story. You, you see the liturgy and you see the Bible. They're, they're, they, they line up on each other. And it's so personal, okay? It's, it's a, you feel the affection in that? Like, and you're just like, I need someone to conquer someone I can't conquer. That's what we're doing here. After the renunciation and affirmations, our baptismal liturgy continues with a deeply biblical prayer, and it recalls Cyril of Jerusalem in many ways, um, recalling these ancient stories of Israel's deliverance from the Red Sea and of Noah's deliverance in the ark from the flood. Our baptismal prayers are all plural. We say them together, united together with one voice, because the normal practice is that um, even with baptism, it's usually not one person that gets baptized. We're happy to baptize one person, but we bring all these people together into a catechesis class so that even as we come to baptism, ideally, we're not coming by ourselves. Even if you came by yourself, right, to be baptized, the whole church who's all been baptized are there confessing with you. So um, even then, um, it's plural, but even if we do, not, we do come alone, we're never alone. We're joined by the church. Um, and this points us to Jesus. We, we say, if we say we have fellowship with God and we, don't, and we don't love our brother, we don't have God. That's what John says. But if we have fellowship with God, we will then have fellowship with one another. Um, and that is a fellowship that is, it's, the waters of baptism are thicker than blood. Like our, the water that engulfs us, that unites us, is more significant than our our biological families. It doesn't discount that. And it, biological families still matter. Absolutely, no question. But they're, they're, in, they're encompassed in deeper reality. That's what we're doing. God doesn't merely declare, he acts. As he washed away everything in Noah's past, so he rinses away whatever idols you have clung to, whatever evil you have done, whatever sins plague your conscience. You died, Paul says, when you were united to Christ's death. Now then, consider yourself dead. Consider yourself dead, Christian. Believe what baptism tells you. Christians don't live toward death, but from death. Death lies behind us, and we live our baptismal death every day, killing the world's lusts and lures. As it gives the gift of death, baptism gives the gift of an open future. Um, that's poetic enough, but as I, as I ended last time with uh, a, a quote from Malcolm Geit, um, reflecting on uh, an old poem um, about prayer, here's, here's a good poem to hold this together. This is called The Christian Plummet. Down into the icy depths you plunge, the old dark undertow of your depression. Even your memories of light made strange as you fall further from all comprehension. You feel as though they've, they've thrown you overboard. Your fellow Christians are on the sunlit deck, a stone-cold Jonah on whom scorn is poured a sacrifice to save them from the wreck. But someone has their hands on your long line. You sound for them the depths they shall sail above. One who takes Jonah as his only sign sinks lower still to hold you in his love. Though you cannot see or speak or breathe, the everlasting arms are underneath. That's a... <laughs> Mm. That's a poem about prayer, but it's a poem about baptism, remembering our baptism. 
depression, feeling, feeling thrown overboard and abandoned by your fellow Christians, whatever, like all the different things described here. He comes underneath us and the depths, arms underneath. So uh, poetry speaks better than prose a lot of the time. So that's one of the things that I'm trying to do at the end is like let Malcolm Geit teach the catechism to us with a couple poems, right? Um, uh, that's, that's the kind of thing that sticks with you, that image. Um, we started with an image, we ended with a poem. Uh, if you don't remember all the fine-tuned details, that's okay. I don't either. <laughs> I have a script. I wrote it out. It's right here in front of me. Um, we're at 1010. We don't have to go till 1030, but I'm open to any and all questions if you want to offer them now out loud, or we can hang out and talk a little bit more afterwards, too. Or we can be done early. Thanks be to God. Any uh, questions? Uh, yeah. Some sort of say something I'm asking, too. But, um, this, is, this is very deep. Like, I'm a deep thinker, reader. I love poetry and imagery. And this is deep stuff. You, you, you acknowledge that. This is, this is some of us might be struggling to kind of grab all of it. Um, there's a lot there. I, you know, I used to run a coach some of your guys' kids. And I, I know sometimes when I coach little kids, I would give kind of a, okay, we've got to press up on defense, we've got to mark our man, we've got to try not to get off sides, we've got to, we've got to pull back, and we've got to keep our shape, use a lot of language. And I see some of the kids are like, yeah, yeah. And some of the kids are like, what? Keep our shape? Like, how do I change shape? You know, the soup, and, and, um, and I remember often I would end that by saying, if you're really confused by what I'm saying, here's, this, here's what we're trying to do. If you don't know what to do, try to kick it in their goal and try to not get let them kick it in our. And I, I just, I, I wonder, like, what, what's that version of this today? Yeah. And I, I wrote something down, and you correct me or make it better. Is that, is that okay? Go for it. So we're made in God's image. God made us. But we, we sin and we go our own way. Like Adam, we, we do our own thing. We need to repent, turn away from ourselves, our sin, and follow Jesus, turn away from Satan. And there's a powerful gift for us in baptism that the church has been doing a long time. Even if we don't understand it all, there's some good stuff that's being given to us, like a gift in baptism. And we need to do it together. We kind of do it alone in a sense, but like you were saying, we do it together. It's a, because we because we can't. If we go our own way, we're on our own, that's bad. We need each other, and most of all, we all need Christ. Um, could you improve on that as far as no, kicking it's... their goal or kicking our goal? Yeah, so uh, something, something C.S. Lewis said with, like, I, I feel like he said it multiple times, but he, he like, I'm going to use an example. I'm going to use an imagery. I'm going to use a poem. I'm going to use a picture of a tree with cracks underneath it or whatever. If it helps you, use it. If it doesn't, get rid of it in your mind, okay? Like if your thing isn't poetry, don't think about it, right? If your thing is poetry, try to act like you know what poetry means. That's a, that's a, I, my thing isn't poetry. I'm learning to love it. Um, if your, your thing isn't any of the of the pieces of the whole, remember that. That is that's a that is a, a baseline confession. And I would say, I would say even more simply than that, just remember your baptism. Think about water, okay? You can be, I mean, maybe even picture a young or an old, maybe an infant or just a, a severely mentally handicapped person who can't understand all these mysteries, but they can feel water, the cleansing of water. There. That's it. Like, that, that can be, in the context of the church, enough. Without any cognition, significant cognition whatsoever. So that's so important. Don't, don't I mean, have conversations with your sponsor. Maybe go deeper into things. Um, but don't, don't feel like you have to understand all this. Absolutely. Just remember your baptism. Um, that, that will point you to Jesus fundamentally. He is our hope. 
So on one side of baptism, there's the Pharaoh. There's the world, the flesh, and the devil, all the bad stuff that we're running away from. We go through the waters of that baptism, and then we come out to newness of life. That's Christ. Like, he, is, he encompasses all of that. So remember what you came from, what you're going towards, and who accomplishes that and helps us and holds us and saves us. Who we're doing that with. Talk about the church, too. Right? Like, all of it. it there's a lot coming together there. There's a whole lot coming together. And that's the thing. I mean, something the Sam is saying very helpfully is that, again, over and over again, you don't have to pass the test. Be like a child. Unless you come like a child, not like a know-it-all, you don't inherit the kingdom of God. So don't. Don't act like, oh, I understood everything Chris just said because I don't even understand everything I just said, okay? <laughs> Uh, so don't, don't be that person, um, and expect that you will get to explore it more and more as you get older. Um, and that you'll, you'll one little phrase or one little image, you'll, it'll finally click for you. And you're like, holy smokes. I remember Chris drove, wrote a, put a tree with some weird cracks underneath and I never sort of got that. And maybe after I maybe read that great divorce or something, I understood it a little bit more, or I read from Isaiah about the the root of the stump of Jesse being cut off and then a new righteous branch coming out of it. And then like, whatever it is, like it, it might come back to you later, but um, if it's not helpful for you right now, I encourage you just push it to the side. Even if it's true, even if it's a good doctrine, don't expect that you have to have to grasp it right now. I think you're right though. Absolutely. Yeah. Anybody have a, a bow? Yes. They licensed that here in McGlade, actually. Yes. I think the thing that spoke to me was your uh, picture of um, if I... what, what's the word? Um, the air who has a castle and a kingdom around it. And it's all his, but he has never seen, maybe outside the family suite of the castle or whatever, but as he grows, he will see more of the castle and more of the kingdom. And uh, that's how I feel in my life. I started out in the family suite, but as I grew, I learned more and more. And I'll never, I'll never know the whole kingdom here. But I, I think that was a good explanation of how you go. We say we walk deeper in Jesus or we walk closer. But I think that's a good analogy for the same idea. Mm -hmm. Is that we get to see more and more of the kingdom. And hopefully more of those thin spaces appear in our lives where it's really close. And you feel like you get a glimpse mm. of what the future holds. And, and also, the idea that death is not the end. Mm. Not for us. Death is not the end. It's just a door where we go and get to see the rest of the kingdom. And it'll take eternity yeah. to see all that. So, um, that, that to me was a great comfort and reassurance. Well, that, what you said there is so important. When you, when you go to heaven, that's not the end, guys, right? You will, you will be exploring, this is what Lewis says when he says, we go further up and further in, in Narnia. Like, you'll never get to the end of him, of the inheritance. You'll never get in, to the end of the joy and the love and the fullness. Um, it'll, be, it'll be always ascending and never completed, which, which means you'll always be a creature dependent upon your creator. You'll, even, even when we're freed from this body of death and Christ restores the new heavens and the new earth and resurrects us in new resurrection bodies and restores the whole earth. That's going to be a great day for sure. But we, we don't thereby then become self-sufficient or all knowing we will. It, it's not done. It's not like an endless choir practice after that. Right. Um, oh, now we're all perfect and we're done. The, the goal is complete. No, actually, there's still more to pursue. There's still more of the kingdom grounds. But, the, but the, also the flip side of that is exactly what you said. What matters most is that you were born into the nursery. 
the, the nursery, that little tidy room, that's the foundation, that's the core. It's all yours because you're born in to it, okay? Um, so whether or not you know the vast expanses of the kingdom where this creek meets that creek and this town, it, like, or just the corners of the castle that you live in or whatever, it's that, that's the foundational thing. You, you know that nursery backwards and forwards. And even if you don't, even if you don't know how the kingdom is governed and all the laws and that dad does this on, you know, whatever. And like, it doesn't matter. It's still yours. It's still your inheritance. So, yeah, I love that image. Yeah. You could run with that one forever. I think it's because it's Bible image. I love the uh, sort of the correlation with like vows. Yeah, you don't, you don't fall in and out of marriage as your love goes up and down, right? But we, have, we, we need renewal of marriage vow ceremonies, right? It's, that's an important liturgy. Is that the most important part about marriage? Absolutely not. You need the love that the vows point to, right? But yeah, that's a, I love that, yeah. A lot of things coming together, so. But it's very moving in the Easter visual. When we repeat our baptismal vow, I was baptized as a baby. I don't remember that. I wonder if because I was baptized, um, my words may not be quite correct, but I was kind of set apart uh, to get the opportunity to grow up and accept Jesus. But as an adult, having not even thought about baptism for years, to go to the Easter Vigil and repeat my baptismal vows as an adult and more or less know what I'm doing mm -hmm. was unbelievable to realize that that happened and um, that it was real. Now, I was baptized again when I, I came to a more mature realization. I got dumped in a lake. But I think that was more for me saying, look, guys, I'm dead to the world and alive to Christ. And it was a statement for me. But I was baptized as an infant. And uh, I, have, I have questions about infant baptism. But it, it still means a lot to me when I say my baptismal vows that when I was two weeks old, somebody did for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. That, you know. Yeah, there's a lot. We'll, we'll say a whole lot more about uh, that those kinds of questions, sacramental yeah. questions, um, a, little, a little bit later. But um, yeah, it's it is a, a really good analogy. Is that you are given the deed to the inheritance, but you uh, confirmation is like I turned eighteen now, and the deed has it's transferred to me now, and I am the I am the arbiter or the the executor of the of the estate now or something like that it's yours it's already it's already it's already solidly yours but you grow up into it and it becomes yours at, at maturity um, and you own it and then you then you walk into it so that's what we should expect um, yeah one of my favorite emphasis is what people are saying even when you talk about marriage and that kind of stuff is <clears throat> one of our uh, heresies or lies of modern life is Same as being in a war with your band brother. Of 
pornography is not a relationship with a woman. Uh, we have a lot of fake, you know, fake love, fake war. We've been gone from make love, make war, you know, make, war, make love, not war, to like fake love, fake war. Uh, and that's our Russell Moore thing to say that. But um, it's so true that what we think, and, and even just like me watching the Mountaineers like by myself, that's something. It's not, <clears throat> but going down your field is very different. And being together and doing the liturgies, literal liturgies together. First down, you know, we are made to be together. And we Americans are super independent. There's so many good gifts in that. And but there's the other side of it is this radical independence, which is an illusion. Mm-hmm. And I think it's I love the way you just like embrace the fact Satan wants to get you. You know, it sounds like an old thing. Well, man is going, he is going to get you. Like, and that's what he does, and he's great at it. Yeah, well, the, uh, we're we're at it here at time, but uh, the the systems, in, in including the church, often can become churches. I w- I wouldn't say the church, capital C, throughout time, but churches can be antagonistic to that reality as well. Um, so, one of the reasons why we denounce, we renounce the world, the flesh, and the devil. The flesh is so important, and that gets into everything. Pride twists everything. Uh, even, even our theology of baptism become, can become a divisive pride sort of thing, and we can, we can exist to defend that doctrine and forget that the doctrine is intended to point to Jesus. We can just be all about this doctrine. For whatever, whatever you confess about that doctrine, are you credo, pedo, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, it can become the thing that you're about instead of the thing that it's intended to point to. The devil's very happy uh, for you to have very religious uh, distractions that are not that, that are not about Christ. Um, I would I would rather someone worship at West Virginia Mountaineer Field uh, than worship at some churches because there's something truer about when they get together and they paint their faces and they cheer for this thing together, you know, um, that can be truer than some of the things that are confessed and believed and practiced in some churches. And we, here, here's the thing. If we think those are only churches out there and we think it's not going to get to us, we're the, we're gonna, we're the next mark. <laughs> okay. So we're always waging war. Um, and we do it together. We need each other to see our blind spots and all that kind of stuff too. So, um, this is awesome. Love you guys. Next week, we're going to get into, We're going to cover the doctrine of God completely next week. (laughs) Isn't that hilarious? The Apostles' Creed, i.e. the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who he is and what he has come to do. Uh, We're going to cover that next week. So if you think that covering all of and understanding all of baptism or even just the baptismal liturgy that you're going to grasp it today... Just wait till next week, guys. It's a joke. I mean, it's like a hilarious joke. It's like saying, oh, I know my wife the day we get married. (laughs) Or she knows me the day we get married. Like, yeah, right. You know, that's all the comedians are right. Like, that's not a marriage. A marriage is, I heard this joke, a marriage is when you get to the airport the next day and she's like, I forgot my passport. Uh, and then and he's like well I'll, I'm going to Mexico by myself so uh, that's marriage right so like yeah that's true but it's still marriage like the ceremony the, the ritual the thing it's, it's real it's not, uh, not real it's just you're going to figure out what it means a lot more the next day whenever you don't have your passport so um, go in peace love you guys